What is so rare as a day in June? Then, if ever, come perfect days. It certainly is a beautiful day here in the Finger Lakes, gang. Let's head down to the pond and skip some stones. Okay, there's a lot of bass in this pond. This is going to be a wake-up call for them. Sorry about this, guys. Throw it in and... Plump. Not much of a skip there, right? Let's see what happens. I'm good at this, guys. Not very, huh? Not very. Get a little closer. Not fall in. Oh, much better. Oh, yeah, that's a take. Let's try it in slow motion. Oh, yeah, that's a take. By this time, you're probably asking, what the heck is Matilski doing this for? What in the world could this have to do with X-ray astronomy? Well, let's go back inside and we'll find out. So what does all this have to do with X-ray astronomy? Well, it turns out that unlike visible light, which you can image using a set of mirrors or lenses very, in a very straightforward fashion, such as you see on the video in front of you, X-rays don't quite work that way. Now, we've already talked about imaging with a lens. It turns out that when you use mirrors, the process is similar. The reason that mirrors are used, though, is that it's much easier to support a large mirror because you have that entire area behind it to actually make sure that things don't warp or change their dimensions, whereas when you look at a lens, it's supported just around its periphery, and when you do that, you run the risk of having the lens actually sag. So the largest telescopes for many, many years have always been made with mirrors. So let's look and see what happens when we look at visible and X-ray light. Here you see what happens to visible light. Light comes from the stars, hits the mirror, and no matter where it hits the mirror, it comes to a focus and you can collect the photons and look at your image. Unfortunately, what happens in x-rays is that, look, they just don't go anywhere. They get absorbed. And because they get absorbed, we would lose all of that precious information coming from the stars. But fortunately, like skipping stones along our pond, if we allow the x-rays to come incident to a set of mirrors at a grazing angle, it turns out that we can reflect them and thereby make an x-ray image. Let's see what that looks like. If you actually have x-rays incident on a set of mirrors at grazing incidents, very similar to the way we just skipped some stones on the pond, it turns out that you can image them in a way that allows you to use a set of nested mirrors similar to the way we use regular mirrors for regular telescopes. And this is what it looks like. The x-rays come in, hit first a set of parabolic mirrors, and then at grazing incidents hit hyperbolic mirrors, and then on they go towards the focal point where our x-ray detector is located. Let's see what that looks like in three dimensions. Here you see the telescope in action. If we had an ordinary mirror, it wouldn't be able to obtain any x-rays. But at grazing incidence, you can see that photons coming in all along the periphery of these mirrors 
can now get collected at our detector and an image can result. Before the advent of these mirrors, though, around 1980 was the first time we were able to use them, what did we do? How could we collect the light? Well, things were a lot simpler then. Even though we couldn't get an image, we could at least figure out how or where something might be coming from in the sky with very primitive means. What we had were devices like this. All this is is a paper towel roll. Now imagine that you have a retina, some means of recording photons, but you don't have a lens that allows you to focus your light. How can you figure out where anything is coming from? Well, it turns out that in this primitive situation, what you can do is just hold this thing up to your eye and just kind of cruise around. You want to see what's light? Just look for light. You're not going to be able to see any objects because you don't have a lens, but as you cruise around, oh, things are getting brighter. Things are getting, oh, there's a source of light. Okay. And that's the way we used to do it in the olden days of X-ray astronomy in the 1960s. And it turns out that this was a big, big problem for us because these X-ray sources were sometimes buried in a myriad of stars, any one of which could have been the X-ray source. We just didn't have accurate enough positions to do the subtle things that we now can do in understanding where these X-rays come from. What you see in front of you is a one degree square part of the sky that has been imaged by the Palomar telescopes and is part of their Palomar Sky Survey. One degree on a side is about all we could do without the advent of X-ray mirrors. Our collimators were primitive and one degree was really doing well. So look at this. This is an image of the region of the sky that contains SCO X1, the brightest X-ray source in the sky. Now, it is apparently the brightest X-ray source in the sky because like the sun, even though the sun is the brightest thing that we see, the sun isn't the brightest thing out there. This is similar in the case of SCO X1. It's the brightest thing that we see, but as we shall find out later on in this course, there are other objects that emit X-rays even more prodigiously than SCO X1. But look at this image. Hundreds and hundreds and thousands and thousands of stars. And which one is the X-ray source? Right over here by the arrow. This little tiny dot that seems to be so inconspicuous is the source of the greatest amount of X-rays that we get every second from the sky in the celestial realm of the stars. You can imagine the difficulty in picking this object out without having the means of imaging X-rays and being able to pinpoint this little tiny spot that turns out to be SCO X1. Well, now that we understand a little bit more about the way X-rays can be imaged in our telescopes, it's time to move on and explore how our eyes perceive these images and what our eyes tell us about them. And that will be the subject for our next lecture.